It's my pleasure to welcome you here to the Clark Howard Show, where our mission is to serve you with knowledge and information that empowers you to make better financial decisions in your life. One way you can make a difference in a child's life is to participate in our 33rd annual Clark's Christmas Kids campaign. You go to clarkschristmaskids.com, you'll see you can sponsor a child in foster care so he or she can have gifts this Christmas morning. And this is something that has been so important to me, but obviously important to you that this has been a successful ongoing campaign now for a third of a century. So thank you for your past generosity. If you can help today or this Christmas, appreciate it very much and look forward to your generosity in the future as well. So there's a new study out about health care that, man, is it disturbing. And I'm going to tell you about it. Also, I want to tell you later about a new rule involving how parental assets affect a child's eligibility for college financial aid. Brand new change. And want you to know about it if you have teenagers that are on a glide path towards college. There's something you need to think about with your money going forward that will help you and not hurt their eligibility for financial aid. So the health care thing. Americans overwhelmingly now have health coverage. Highest percent, maybe, since those stats were kept. And so we do have a portion of the population uninsured, but it's hovering somewhere around 10% or so, maybe a little more than 10. That's a lot fewer people who are uninsured than prior. But the way health plans work, and something that's been a clear trend with employers, it's not your friend, is higher and higher deductibles. And when you seek medical care, you're having to pay a bigger share of that care, bigger dollars than in the past. And so now, according to a report in Kiplinger, more than half of Americans say that even with insurance, that the costs they have to pay strain them so much financially that a lot of people, almost 40%, are not getting the care or delaying receiving it because they dread the bills. And then the consequence is roughly 60% of people end up in worse shape medically than they would have if they'd sought care earlier. I mean, this is a bad trend line. And, you know, one of the weird consequences of it with the employers doing this cost shifting of more and more of the dollars coming out of the employee's pocket is that employers end up paying more later because as people get sicker, the cost of the care becomes more acute because the person's sicker and it costs everybody more money. Um, I've talked before about the role of having more primary care in the U.S. being a key thing to improving people's health and also to reduce overall medical costs. It's weird, but there was a study that found for every $1 spent on primary care, it reduced $10 in expenses downstream. I've only seen one study that said that, and those numbers may be inflated, but it's a clear cause and effect that when we don't treat things early, they get larger later. They don't just go away so often with medical. So I've been thinking about this, and we can't make employers change how they reimburse us because they're suffering too because the cost of health care has become so much. So I was thinking about the real key here is shopping around. When you have something that's Uh, something you need to attend to, but is not emergency care, may even be in the category of urgent. You shop. I've talked about this before with 
simple things like imaging that if you go to if you go shop the marketplace for if you need a MRI or something like that that you can pay so little at freestanding MRI facilities versus one related to a hospital that it's incredible the price difference and that's just a glaring example but with so much of healthcare thinking through shopping around for something you have to have done is really important to eliminate the big risk you face with bills you can't afford with medical and also the big risk that I think is bigger of you ending up sicker or possibly dead because you deferred care. So medicine doesn't make it easy. People in medicine hate what's known as price transparency. They hate telling you what something's going to cost. So you have to work at it. But it's worth working at to preserve your wallet and your health. Krista? Okay, this first question is from Steve in Indiana. My parents offered to loan money to us for a home purchase so we could avoid dealing with the currently high mortgage rates. What sort of things do I need to consider before setting up this arrangement? Are there restrictions from the IRS? Would this negatively impact our ability to buy a home in any way? No, not at all. In fact, it improves your ability to buy a home when you have what the industry refers to as a mezzanine loan where you have a loan that the seller doesn't have to worry, you're actually going to be able to get the deal done and close. So there are IRS requirements, and the IRS requirements are quite favorable to the family borrower. You have to be charged what the IRS establishes every 90 days as an acceptable rate of interest, or otherwise it's treated as if your parents gave you a gift. They are giving you a gift because they're making a loan for a home that eliminates a wide variety of closing costs and they're willing to make you a loan at what would be well below market rates but legal within the IRS requirements. And so if you search the IRS website, it comes up easily where uh, private loan interest rates, I think is the term, or family loan interest rates, we've done that before. It's a, it's a quick and easy search on irs.gov, and it'll show you the current table for that 90-day period of what interest rate is acceptable. And there's a trick that accountants will have you do, which is they'll have uh, your parents do a loan that is a 10-year loan amortized over 30 years because if they're trying to give you the lowest possible legal interest rate, if the loan term is under 10 years, the interest rate that the IRS requires is much lower than on a 30-year. And then the parents can just re-up the loan 10 years out or maybe at that point, interest rates will be at a point that you want to refi on your own. Um, The risk is really to your parents that if at some point uh, something happened in your life and you didn't pay, your parents are then in a, a terrible situation where they have to choose if they're going to foreclose or what are they going to do about the money you're not paying. So the risk is always to the lender in that case, not you as the borrower. Um, one other thing, you have to have this done like a traditional real estate closing with a lawyer um, who does the proper paperwork where the loan is secured by the real estate, i.e. a mortgage. As long as you do that, you're good to go. Jocelyn in New Hampshire says, I have a question about mutual funds versus ETFs. I know ETFs are better for taxable accounts, but what about an IRA? Everyone says ETFs have a lower expense ratio, but the mutual funds give a much better payout each year. For example, I had $50,000 in a healthcare fund from Vanguard, and I got $2,000 each year as a payout. If it had a, it had a slightly higher expense ratio than a comparable healthcare ETF, but the ETF didn't pay as much each year, like $100 for 50, a $50,000 investment. It seems the only way to make real money on the ETFs is when the stock price goes up, while within with a mutual fund, you have you make money each year from the payouts, and when the price of the fund goes up, 
What am I missing? And why does everyone always say invest in ETFs versus mutual funds? So I don't know that everybody says do ETFs. I mean, ETFs uh, can be an absolute part of your picture. You're with Vanguard. So the ETFs at Vanguard are the mirror image of index funds at Vanguard. They have the same makeup. Uh, They generally have the same expense ratio. So the idea of a typical ETF, the successful ETFs, is they're broad market indexes, just like an index fund. A mutual fund, on the other hand, has different priorities. It will have higher expenses. You mentioned something very important that bears repeating. Mutual funds in a taxable account can be a tax time bomb because of turnover in the investments. Holders of those funds get hit with a big tax bill each year because of the turnover of holdings generating uh, what can be very sizable tax bills. So that's why in a taxable account, it's recommended that you own, if you own funds, you own only index funds or that you own their cousin or sibling, whatever you would call it, the exchange traded fund version. So you mentioned that the healthcare fund you're in is throwing off really nice dividends each year, but that healthcare mutual fund is designed for that where the index fund and the ETF, they're just passing on to you whatever dividends the holdings within that fund generate. So their goal is different. Their goal is long-term increase in the value of the holding at the lowest possible cost, where mutual funds can have different goals and objectives. They can be about generating current income as well as long-term growth. They'll have less long-term growth, because the emphasis is on current income. So that's the distinction that is an important difference. What are you trying to achieve? And if what you're trying to achieve is receiving more dividend income each year, that's a different kind of holding and typically you done in a mutual fund. And Marcelino in New Mexico says, I want to see my first total eclipse ever on April 8th, 2024. I've been looking for hotels in the path of totality, but I'm seeing prices of $3,000 per night. Right. Do you know of any tips or tricks that I can use to save on this trip? Thank you. Best show ever. Thank you, Marcelino. (laughs) Okay. So I want to take you back to 2017. I was at something that was, in my mind, equally as important as a total eclipse. I was at the Super Bowl in Houston, but flights to Houston... And hotels in Houston were crazy expensive. Hotels were, uh, most of them were well more than $1,000 a night. So, and the flights, as I said, were very expensive. So I flew to Austin, Texas, which is, uh, gosh, it's a two and a half hour drive away. Stayed in a hotel in Austin, drove across for the game, drove back, My hotel in Austin was less than $100 a night, and the drive back was one of the worst, longest drives (laughs) of my life in the wee hours because my team lost in the Super Bowl. That darn Tom Brady. Biggest face plant in the history of the Super Bowl, Mm -hmm. up 28 to 3. Yeah, it was fun. And lost in overtime. (laughs) Great halftime show. Oh, man. Anyway, um, the point is, that when you're going to a special event that has huge uh, interest, the greatest way for you to save money is to inconvenience yourself and stay somewhere that is an hour or two away, drive over as the time calls for, for the total eclipse. And then when it's over, you drive back to save that money. Uh, The other alternative is in the path of the eclipse, there will be a lot of short-term rentals where people are renting out rooms in their homes that will be posted in advance at very high costs. But as we get closer to April of next year, the costs of those private home rentals, rooms in a home, will go steadily down on Airbnb. 
So both are strategies. If you book a refundable hotel or a hotel room that you can cancel up to a few days out without any penalty that is in that zone one to two hours away, and then if a deal pops up on an Airbnb or even a hotel room close to the path, then you cancel the original booking and you move to the booking that is close to or right in the path of the eclipse. And I hope that in the eclipse, every team wins, unlike what happened to me in the Super Bowl. And uh, eclipses are, as the warnings will continue, remember eye protection, eye protection, eye protection with the eclipse. You ever seen a partial eclipse? Um, yeah, actually. And I remember in Clark Deals, the last one, um, we had like all these deals on the protective glasses and stuff. That was fun. A lot of people were buying those. So I, the last one that, that passed over where I was, there was total cloud cover uh, the day of the eclipse. So I saw nothing other than it got kind of darker for a while and then lit back up. Yeah, that's a bummer. That is a bummer. <laughs> Think about somebody paying three thousand oh dollars for a yeah. hotel room, and then there's cloud cover in the path. Yeah, that would be bad. That would be really bad. Well, I'll tell you, there's something good coming up, and that's the financial aid formula for college has gone through uh, another change, and this one is actually good for parents. I'm going to tell you how it works. You know, I've always had this thing. I've said to parents of children from preschool age through high school that don't allow guilt to throw you off your path of saving for your own retirement. And this has been a problem for decades since college costs got to a point where they were so brutally expensive. And so parents feel this enormous responsibility to fund a child's college at wherever their dream school is. And so parents will participate in these plans. I love these 529 college savings plans that are, if you go in the right plan, and what's a right plan? Some of them have really high costs. Even Some of them even have ridiculous commissions. And then there are others that have low costs and no commissions. And uh, I'm digressing here, but if you're looking at a 529, never buy one from a salesperson. Never, 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 not ever, no exception. You never buy a 529 plan from a commission salesperson. You only buy a 529 plan that is known as direct sold. We just go to a website and you sign up for an account and you put money into it, period. And I have a guide at Clark.com that we update regularly the lowest cost 529 plans in the country. And these plans are co-sponsored by states. And there are cases where investing in your own state plan would be superior. And we show you how to decide if you should go in your own state plan or if it's a crummy one, go in one of these others. So that's it. I digress. But 529 plans are great. But saving for your own retirement is more important. And parents repeatedly sacrifice saving in a workplace 401k and instead put money into the 529. And there are scholarships. uh, A kid can work. They can go to a less expensive school. They can go to a commuter school. They can go to a community college first and then a four-year college, although many community colleges now offer four-year degrees. There are many ways to get the skills, the education. How many scholarships are there in retirement? Uh, None. I mean, retirement, you got me, myself, and I to count on. And that's why it's a higher priority. And you have to overcome that parental guilt. Well, now there's another incentive. The uh, FAFSA the form that parents love to hate filling out that uh, sets a formula for qualifying your child for financial aid. The FAFSA formula just changed last week. And under the new FAFSA formula, 
money put into a workplace retirement plan, most often a 401k, does not affect eligibility for financial aid under the formula. This is big. This is big time stuff because up till now, parents were punished for saving money for retirement towards a kid's college age eligibility and no more. So it even gives yet another reason why making sure you're saving for your own retirement comes first. And yes, things have changed. If you've listened to the podcast a long time, you know that I was fortunate to be able to work my way through college. Tuitions were much lower, the cost of college much lower, the facilities much more spartan at colleges. Um, you know, all I had to do was uh, dodge dinosaurs. I went to college so long ago. But today, college costs are such that if you go to a traditional, what I call sleepaway college, the costs can be so high that there's no way a student can just work his or her way through easily and cover those costs. It's a different burden. But the facts remain the same. Parents have got to take care of their long term as a higher priority than saving and paying for their kids' college. Don't accept the guilt trip. Krista? Okay, Eric in Idaho says, recently an unknown charge from Amazon Marketplace appeared on my credit card. I contacted Amazon and they confirmed that the purchase came from an Amazon account we did not own. We notified our credit card company of the fraud via the online tool and they issued a new credit card number. Three weeks later, we had another unknown charge from Amazon Marketplace and they confirmed again that it was from an account we did not own. Suspicious that the number was compromised so quickly, I called my credit card company and was connected to a fraud manager. She explained that digital wallets like Apple or Google subscribe to an update service and automatically receive updated credit card numbers if a card number is canceled. We verified this by watching our digital wallets update the new to the newest credit card number without intervention by us. The fraud manager explained that we needed to call and specifically request that all digital wallets be disconnected in order to avoid this problem. Um, and they said, thanks, they enjoy the show. They're wondering how this makes sense. And I also okay. had this happen, just so you know, just a third, like another person verifying that I got a new credit card and I didn't update it on my app, but it was automatically updated on my Google Pay. So this is, this is the problem is, and this is the first time we've had it. Remember, when you use a digital wallet, it's sending a one-time use code each time you use it, which means that the person's Apple or Google wallet in each your you know in each case was the one that's been broken into. They have figured well, out access to the keys to the kingdom. Well, I don't know. I think maybe they have like an Apple or Google wallet, but they got this person's original credit card number and entered it into their own digital payment system. They, it doesn't mean they got into your wallet. It could mean that they just have all their credit card info entered it into the wallet. And then the wallet automatically updates when you get a new credit card. Number. So then, so then uh, the fraud person at the credit card company said disconnect everything from your digital wallet. So that would also make it not active uh, for the for the, the criminal. Mm -hmm. So it's not so much they've likely hacked into your Google wallet or someone's Apple wallet. They've actually, uh, they've actually been able to take a card that is active on Apple Wallet or Google Wallet and use it that way. Yeah, I assume it's much easier. It would be much easier if they got your credit card info and they just enter it into their own wallet. So just for now, if if you suddenly have mysterious activity and it's not the card itself that's being hacked, mm -hmm. you stop using Apple Pay or you, you tell them disconnect all digital wallets at the credit card company. Say disconnect this card from all digital wallets that exist. That's a great tip. I wouldn't have thought yeah. that. I've had credit card numbers compromised. And I've never done that. So, this is this smart is criminals. really interesting because yeah. that explains why we've been having these mysteries where the same card is getting yeah. compromised again and again. 
Had no idea. Why is that not general information out there? I don't know. We, but we're well, Eric we're, in we're Idaho now sharing it with you. Thank you, Eric, for bringing that to our attention. That's crazy. Okay, that makes a lot of things make sense now. <laughs> Kevin in Pennsylvania says, "Tip: I heard of a new to me anyway scam. A business gets a call from someone claiming to be from the card processing company. They state that they need to reset the credit card terminal." During the reset process, quote unquote, quote unquote, reset, they provide a credit card number for you to charge $50 to $60. Then they ask you to do a chargeback for a much larger number. I told my employees if they get such a call to hang up and call the support number on the terminal. Wow. Wow. What a clever con. So it's not a chargeback. They're asking you to give a very large credit against that account. And it's a way of stealing that amount of money from your company. That is fascinating. Um, you know, anytime you get, that's known as a pretext call, where you, if you own a business and you get a call from someone pretending to be with your merchant processor, you don't know it really is them. Never, ever follow any instructions in a phone call place to you by someone pretending to be your merchant processor. If there is a problem, you just say, thank you very much for alerting me. You hang up, and then you call the known number that's on your terminal to call your processor, and you'll find out that nobody was actually calling you with a set of unsolicited instructions like that. Liz in Virginia says, Clark mentioned purchasing well-made furniture used. I think it's worth mentioning that while some people don't like to buy these pieces because they're bulky and very dated looking, these pieces can be very easily transformed into sleek, gorgeous, modern looking pieces by using furniture paint or refinishing and replacing old dated knobs with new ones. There are plenty of YouTube videos showing people the best way to paint or refinish furniture. With an hour or two of not so hard labor, you can have beautiful, modern, well-made furniture. You know, that would have been a really funny YouTube video when I bought old furniture and attempted to refinish it myself. Oh, was it a disaster. I have seen people do amazing things. It's yeah, so true. Just not, not me. Not you. No. Doing, I am I not the one you want doing that kind of stuff. But it is a great suggestion. And uh, you have to have some ability, which apparently I have no ability at handy person kind of stuff. Well, we already knew that, <laughs> but it is a great suggestion. What that was about, if you missed that podcast, is that Americans are buying lower and lower quality furniture. It's not just Americans. This is a trend around the world that a lot of people are looking at furniture as disposable, and, it's, and so it's built uh, at lower and lower quality, and people say they don't make things like they used to. Furniture is one thing they don't which is why unloved older furniture that can stand uh, the test of even hundreds of years, but it can even be 40 or 50 years, is a much better buy because nobody wants the stuff. And so it's really, really inexpensive to get. You may even be able to get it for free. But if it does feel dated, I love the suggestion we just had. And thank you so much for joining us today. Do we have a Clarkie today? We have one. This is Laura. Clark, 30 years ago, we started listening to you when my husband was a high school teacher and I was a mid-level government drone. We are retired millionaires today, and you've made a huge difference in our lives. Thank you so much. Well, thank you for sharing that, and I'm so glad that you made the decision in your lives to live on less than what you make, and now you live your life 30 years later uh, with wonderful wealth and the freedom of choices to do what you want. And that's great. A it's, teacher it's, and a, she said, government drone, drone. work yes. for the government. So uh, typical uh, middle-class salaries, although in a lot of states, teachers don't earn a middle-class salary. Um, I, you know, I think it's great because I talked last month or the month before that, how, uh, 12, I think it's 12%, yeah, 12% of American families are now millionaires. And most become millionaires sometime in their 50s or early 60s. How and why? Because through their working lifetime, they participated in an employer retirement plan or did their own IRAs 
lived on less than what they make, gave that money time over the decades to build up, and did just what you did. It's so great. So that is such an uplifting story. Thank you for sharing it. Have an absolutely wonderful day, and we'll be with you tomorrow.